You'd think September on a Canadian flower farm would mean we've reached the end of our season and we're closing up shop, but we're still blooming like crazy. Here in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, we grow all of our own flowers on three quarters of an acre, which we sell down at our local farmer's market and also at our roadside stand. And beginning of September is just the start of the last quarter of our season. We still have six more weeks of selling because we aim to go to Halloween every year. We have a 25 week season, which I think is pretty good considering we're zone five. And the way we're able to achieve that is by planting a spring, summer and fall crop. Right now we've started into fall and so there is lots of flowers as well as things coming on and I'm going to show it all to you and share all the details. One of our favorite and most important summer to fall crops is zinnias and they are still blooming like crazy. Here in Kelowna, zinnias are an incredible best seller. Here, no one really grows these in their gardens. So one of the only ways people get to experience the pure joy that is zinnias is by growing them by local florists. You can't get them imported in, you know, you don't see them very often. So people just go crazy as soon as these show up in the bouquets. This year we started getting the zinnias in August and they're going to produce really strong for me until the frost. We usually get our first frost of the year, you know, beginning to mid October. So I'm going to enjoy these as much as I can. You know, there's one month left of time with them. You know, I just love them. They're so versatile in so many colors. My absolute favorite variety of zinnia to grow is Benary's Giant. And we grow them in, you know, a whole variety of colors. Benary's Giant is the number one zinnia must grow, in my opinion, because they create these massive blooms. The first blooms are as big as the palm of the hand, but even these, you know, blooms after they've been blooming for a month, they're still a really good size. Benary's Giant is also really disease resistant. Zinnias, you know, they just get mildew, powdery mildew like crazy. They get black and they get crispy and they die. Benary's Giant, you know, it's still going to get it too, but it's going to get it a lot later than other varieties. The other variety I just couldn't live without is the Lime Queen series. And I grow all of the colors. This is the orange Lime Queen, which is my favorite, but we grow the blush and we grow the red. They are all incredible. They have these amazing antique colors. The blooms, you know, they're a little bit smaller than the Benary's Giants and they are a little bit more diseased, you know, so, but they're still worth their weight in gold. Must grow. A new variety to us this year is Zowie, which is <laughs> this incredible color. It reminds me of a tequila sunrise drink. It has like pink and then it fades to like a red and a yellow and customers have gone crazy over these. Every single time I use these in a bouquet, they're one of our first selling. I had actually planned on not growing these again <laughs> when they first started. The seeds are really, really expensive, which, you know, had me borderline on them. And when they started, they were really short. The first couple blooms on them were, weren't usable. They bloomed early, but it took a while until I was able to actually cut something off of these plants that was usable. 
If it wasn't for the fact that they sold so strongly, these wouldn't be coming back next year. But, you know, customer's always right, so <laughs> we'll be growing these for a few more years at least. Another summer to fall must grow item on our farm is Cosmos. I have a love-hate relationship with Cosmos. I hate them because they're really difficult to pick. They're really hard to manage. You know, they just become these like overwhelming hedges. They fall apart. Uh, they produce so much, it's hard to keep up with them. But at the same time, they save my butt all the time. You know, when I'm like, oh, I don't know how to finish off this bouquet. I don't know how to, you know, bulk up the size. I don't know how to make it look a little bit romantic. The Cosmos are always there for me. I always have lots and lots of them, you know, when I'm looking for flowers to fill up my bouquets. Um, every year, I get frustrated with them and I say, I'm not gonna grow them, but every year I know <laughs> they're coming back and I'm growing at least a bed of them. The varieties that I'm growing this year are the double click mix. Um, these are a double, so they're these big fluffy pom-pom like, and then they come in these, these mix of colors, this kind of like cranberry and then, you know, like a pinky mauve and a white. Um, you know, the, I used to grow a lot of these and I loved them, but the problem with them is they're, they're really heavy and they can drop petals. So they're very useful when I need them, but I've found after years of growing Cosmos, they're not necessarily my like number one go-to Cosmo. So this year I grew a new variety. This year, half of my Cosmo bed is devoted to single varieties and specifically the afternoon white. The single variety I find just looks a little bit cleaner in the arrangements. It looks a little bit romantic. You know, the flowers are, they open bigger. So even though the doubles are so impressive looking as a single flower in bouquets, I found that the single white has been really, really versatile. With it being the white, I can blend it with almost every single color. Um, and I'm really happy with it. This is my first year growing it, but I suspect that this is gonna be a Cosmo that's gonna be here year after year. The Cosmo that made me fall in love with single Cosmos is this one, the Rubenza. It blooms really early, so I get Cosmos off of this, you know, before I get Cosmos anywhere else. And this dark color, it's just, it's really dramatic and really rich in the bouquets that I make. Um, so this, I actually have this self-seeded all over my farm and the varieties that have come back have ranged from, you know, a, like redder tones to pinker tones and I've been using them like crazy all year. Um, you know, if, honestly, if I had to grow only one Cosmo at this point, Rubenza would be it. Last year we did an experiment with marigolds and I was obsessed. Marigolds add so much to a bouquet. It's one of those things that I didn't think I would like, so it wasn't until, you know, the third year that I tried them out. And, you know, after having just a handful of plants, I knew every year I need at least a bed of these. This year we went with a bunch of colors because um, we wanted to experiment and see with, you know, what all the different plants were like. And it's been heaven <laughs> to have like, you know, hundreds of these plants. The marigolds are a flower that people don't see in the bouquets. They take up a huge amount of space, they add a huge amount of drama to the bouquets, but people don't know what they are, even though they're so common in people's gardens. The other day I had someone comment that they loved the big full mums that I had in the bouquets and they pointed directly to the marigolds. Um, so they, they add a lot of value. The other thing I love about marigolds is even if I can't use all these stems in bouquets, they dry really well. They turn into these lovely little pom-poms that I love to have as dried flowers into the fall. We experimented with doing the giant marigolds that you can get from Johnny's in their cut flower section. And we did it in the yellow and the green and the orange. And I've been happy with them. They produced really well. They're definitely worth the space and time. But the number one marigold for me on my farm has to be Coco Gold, which is behind me. It grew way taller, which made even better stems. It produced way earlier, and the plants had 
you know, way more side branches than the other giant marigolds. The seed's a little bit more expensive, but it's definitely worth the money to spend. This is the one that I'm gonna be having come back year after year, and I'm interested in seeing if there's other colors in the Coco series. If you've been around this channel for any amount of time, you will know I'm obsessed with amaranth. It's my absolute favorite thing in the entire world, and in my opinion, there's no such thing as too much amaranth. So when I planted an entire bed of it, you know, I was pretty sure I still didn't have enough. I put these amaranths in every single fall bouquet that I make and whatever doesn't get used gets dried and then I use every single one of the dried stems as well. The two amaranths I absolutely could not live without is the brown hot biscuit and then the dark burgundy velvet curtain. These two amaranths, I could never have enough. They're beautiful, they're perfect, and I even sell bunches that are just the amaranth and they sell. Growing amaranth can be a little tricky for cut flowers because it's an absolute beast. If you give, give it an inch, it'll take a mile. Amaranth wants to get as big as a tree. So my trick for being able to keep you know, it into a size, because how big the plant is determines how big the bloom is. And if the bloom is this big, it's not gonna be very usable in a bouquet. So what I do is I plant a million amaranth into a tiny little space, and then that forces them to just be these tiny little sad plants, which are perfect to work with as cut flowers. So this bed here has four rows that I used a cedar to direct seed. And you can see in here, there is like in this space alone, there's probably 20 amaranth plants, you know, and that's just what germinated. The amount of seed that I dropped into this space is crazy. But by doing this, it makes it an incredibly easy crop for me to grow instead of you know starting it ahead of time in a seed tray and transplanting it and giving it all this space and then having to cut it at the top so it sends up side branches that are usable i just dump a bunch of seed it's such a weed that it overpowers almost all the other weeds the only thing that's in here because i haven't weeded this is amaranth the only thing that could compete with amaranth is just weed amaranth um, so, you know, this plant, this plant really thrives on neglect. It's something that almost everyone could grow. The other crop that I love for this time of year, which is also incredibly easy to grow, is grasses. You know, so here I have an entire bed. There's like thousands of grass stems. And this is the same as the amaranth. I just go in there and I plant it and, you know, it does its thing. It outcompetes the weeds because it's such a weed itself. And when I have too much, I just cut it and I hang it to dry and it's still really valuable for me like that. This is a millet, you know, which is great. It has this like little ball and fuzzy texture. Um, but this year I also grew highlander and lowlander and green drops. Um, and a few other varieties that I've been experimenting with. In my opinion, you can never have too much grass. And this year I kind of only planted for the fall season, um, but I was so excited when it came on that I think in future years, I'm gonna be planting a summer crop of grasses too. If you've been following along on the channel this year, you'll know that the experiment that I'm the most excited about is my Cardoon and you guys, this is official success. I have a cardoon flower and it's everything I always wanted. It makes me so happy. I, the truth is I love them so much. I don't even want to sell them. I'm like, they're too precious because I only have a few of them in this entire bed because each cardoon plant produces just, you know, one single flower stock. Um, so in my mind, they're worth a million dollars, but I know I can't make that much money on them. Um, yeah, these are really cool. I really love them. But the thing that I've discovered with doing the experiment of Cardoon this year, oh, I need the snips, is that even though I can't make money and allow myself to grow Cardoon for the flowers in future years, the real value of this crop is in its leaves. These leaves look incredible in bouquets. They give that kind of high-end fern look, which I can't grow <laughs> on my farm because um, I have pure sun and which would be hard for me to get anyways at this heat period that is like August and September. But having these, you know, this, they can really elevate my bouquets. They're quite formal. They're the type of thing I could use in wedding work. Um, and it's, it's a leaf. Each of these plants produces tons and tons of them. So 
I don't know that I can grow a whole bed of cardoon in the future, but I definitely imagine that I'll be able to grow half a bed of cardoon just for the leaves. And there's a chance that if I mulch this, they, they might come back. I'm zone five, so it really is borderline for being perennial. But if I do a bit of work, maybe I can get these, you know, most of the year, which would make me very happy. I've been hoarding them for fall because I know that they're going to keep lasting and there's a chance they might even, you know, survive a frost. So I'm, I'm very excited about these. Not every experiment this year has been a success though. This is my entire bed of carnations. Um, they're the, they're an old fashioned carnation that I got off of Johnny's and they are designed for cut flowers, but they're supposed to be like a smaller spray carnation, not those big fancy ones that you get imported in. They didn't work for me. You know, you can kind of see if I like cut this one off down at, you know, at the very base of the plant, there's, you know, there is some staying stem length there, but it's limited and then the hard part about it is the plant is really brittle so to clean the leaves it's it's difficult you know half of half the stems that i've been cutting i've been breaking and they've been unusable um so it's they've been a struggle i think there's a chance that i just didn't grow them very well i think they could be taller the flowers could be bigger and showier um, if i just grew it a little bit better so i'm willing to experiment again um, but unfortunately i wasn't in carnation heaven that i wanted to be in this summer um, and fall but they smell incredible i mean I, lo I love walking past them and sitting here in the field they have that spicy clove smell that you know makes the carnation so fun the other experiment that i think all of you were the most excited about is my lisianthus and this doesn't look very exciting on the camera i know um but this is exciting for me we oh you're cute the lisianthus bloomed very well we got beautiful incredible flowers off of them for weeks and weeks you know this greenhouse produced an insane amount of stems lisianthus is for sure coming back for us next year but the other thing that lisianthus can potentially do for me which would make it even more <laughs> incredible than it's already been is lisianthus has the potential to bloom again where I am, I'm a little bit borderline. You know, Lisianthus for me doesn't bloom until August. It needs a lot of heat and a lot of time in the ground before it can produce. And I'm Canada zone five, you know, that's just not what I have. But the side branches are coming, the side branches are growing and this is in a tunnel so I can protect this from frost. If I can have Lisianthus blooms in October, that would mean a lot of money, a lot of excitement. You know, it, it would become a transformative crop for us here on the farm. So I'm watching these intently. It doesn't look like much, but what this is to me could be one of the most exciting things that I'm currently seeing on the farm this week. Probably one of the most important and profitable crops on any flower farm is sunflowers. And I am a bad flower farmer because I messed them up so badly this year. Pretty much the only sunflowers we have, you know, consistently this year have been weeds. They've been self-seeded sunflowers that I've been desperate to let grow because I have no other sunflowers. We've just had multiple crop failures and also missing planting dates. You know, it's, it's me and it's the weather. There's everything to possibly blame for doing it wrong, but I did one thing right, and that is planting sunflowers on our last possible window. These sunflowers are the reason why we can have flowers until Halloween, which is past our first frost date. The sunflowers can actually survive the frost and still be there for me to pick, and they sell like crazy, and they look so fall, everyone loves them. So these, you know, it's still a couple more weeks before these are gonna be blooming, but these are gonna, these are gonna get me through, and they're gonna inspire me to not mess up so bad next year. The thing that saved my butt this year is Rubecchia. Without those sunflowers, you know, it's, they have a very specific look and the Rubecchia kind of imitates it really well in bouquets. It's bright, it's cheerful, it's prolific. <laughs> There's lots and lots of it. 
we knew how much we love Rubecchia. We've been growing Rubecchia for a few years now and you know, every year we just want more and more of it. So this year I did a really big experiment on Rubecchia, lots of varieties, lots of options. And so I feel like I have a better idea what it is that I'm looking for in a Rubecchia. The best Rubecchia of all the Rubecchias, the only Rubecchia you need is this variety here and it is Indian summer. The flowers are massive. The first cuts on these, they, they're huge. They're so big um, and they produce and they produce and they produce all season long. These do incredible in the vase. They have really good vase life. Um, they're just simple and classic. They're exactly what I want with a Rubecchia. The Rubecchia that I was really hopeful for is this one here, these beautiful doubles. This is called Double Daisy. Um, but I haven't been able to use it. This Rubecchia, it's just inconsistent as a cut flower. Half the time it lasts perfectly. Um, the other half the time it looks great for a day and then it dies completely. So I just haven't been able to trust it um, in bouquets that I'm sending out because I, I don't want them dying on people. It looks, it looks so good and it dries really well because they're so puffy and full but i don't know that this is going to be coming back to the farm in future years the other variety that i was really excited for because i'm obsessed with all these brown tones is this here it's a mix called sahara you know the different colors different you know some are doubles some are singles and this i was really happy with um, the, the cuts are lasting good in the vase. The only problem is the plants just aren't as productive as those <laughs> Indian summer. You know, it's the Indian summer, it's, it's hard to beat. The Rubecchia trilobia, um, and it's this, you know, clusters of these tiny little, you know, yellow daisies. I love this. I want like a hedge of this. This, this actually, it's really hard for me personally to grow from seed. I've tried for years and years and have struggled, but it self seeds like crazy. So what I really want is to kind of establish a patch where it just kind of does its thing. It comes back every year. Um, but yeah, these are, these are great to use. They take up so much space in a bouquet um, and they're very fun and you know they bring in all the fall vibes so i love this one too another great summer to fall crop for me has been the straw flowers and my status these i love i love them <laughs> they're my favorite last year i had small patches of them and i knew that i needed infinite so having two beds of status has been everything everything i want <laughs> out of a flower farm having lots of colors in the straw flower have been incredible I did a big pick on them and they kind of slowed down for a little bit. We've been getting some cooler nights now. The weather, you know, it's feeling, it's not fall yet. We still get these hot, beautiful Septembers in Kelowna, but the longer nights, that little bit of a coolness, it's really helping these to start to produce again. Um, so I'm excited to have a big flush of these, have these to go. And these are another one that, yeah, the, the frost is still going to kill them, but they're not as frost sensitive as Cosmos and Zinnias are. These, a little bit of frost, they'll survive and they'll keep me going. Having big plantings of this are one of those things that kind of helps push a little bit further, as well as dried flowers. I mean, dried flowers are the ultimate following the frost flower because once they're dry, they last forever. The status in the straw flowers are one that feels really weird to depend on for the fall because they get planted so early in the spring. But there is this category of flowers that kind of act that way. Um, and snapdragons are the perfect example. These we plant in March, April, really early. Our last frost here is kind of, you know, May 1st. So these are getting planted out when it's still quite cold. They bloom kind of into July for me. And then August is, it's just too hot. It's, it's a struggle for me to be able to get them to keep going. But as those cooler nights come in, you know, the shorter daylight, these start to kind of think about doing something else again. And I end up getting this kind of second flush off of them. So this bed here, this is all Potomac. 
snapdragons. And you know, these, these are actually starting to send up stems that I can use kind of for the next couple of weeks. I'm expecting that I'll be able to pick a bucket or two off of this bed. That's, you know, really going to add some like variety into the bouquets that I'm making. And then following that, my earliest blooming snapdragons, my costas and my chantillies, those will start to send up a few stems that I can use. And with these being under a cover, there's a chance that maybe I'll be able to pick a few snapdragon stems into October, which would be incredible. Most of the flowers that I've been sharing with you so far are the flowers that kind of transition from summer to fall. But to go all the way to Halloween, what I really need are plants that will take me past the frost. And that is the real challenge. You know, the sunflowers, you know, I've been experimenting with them. They, you know, they seem to work quite well, you know, but you can't have just a handful of sunflowers. And so this bed here on the farm is one of the most valuable <laughs> beds of all because this is here for me at a time when I don't have anything else to sell. This is sedum. Um, and this is our second year with this planting. We have like a 50 foot bed here and it's just gonna get better and better as the years go. Sedum survives the frost, no problem. This, these flowers, if I wanted to stick these into Christmas wreaths, they'd be there for me. And when they finish blooming and they die off, they just, they keep looking gorgeous. They turn into this rich brown. So, you know, the value of these is really high. Sedum you can use at any point. It actually buds up and it's this beautiful green, um, green roughly balls that you can use in the summer as a filler. Um, but I hoard this entire bed <laughs> waiting for this time of year when I won't have anything else. You know, this little section here is where I have picked out. There's like, two plants. I've started this week for the first time to use it and these two plants have gone into you know I 25 bouquets. So when I look at this and I see this just wall you know just flowers after flowers after flowers what I see is my ability to build 75 bouquets you know for five weeks when I don't have very many options. Having this here you know this is this is like my money in the bank <laughs> when it comes to fall. And I would plant sedums just to be able to do that two week window when, you know, there is nothing else. I need more though than sunflowers and pink sedums. I also need some sort of greenery to finish off bouquets. And greenery is one of those things that you don't think to plant. You don't put a lot of importance on because it's not exciting, but you need a lot of volume. So at this point, we are six weeks off until, or seven weeks, somewhere in there, for our end of season. And I am counting numbers, I'm counting plants. The mint in here, this has been incredible, but I've been, I've been hoarding it. I've only been using bits and pieces in here. Every week I come in and I go, okay, Let's take a sixth of this. Let's take a quarter of this because I want it for the weeks to come. Um, this, this bed, you know, it's, it's perennial stuff. This is a mint. I have a hiss, anise hyssop. I have some oregano. I have Russian tarragon. All these greeneries do really well and they kind of get you there. The Russian tarragon can sometimes get past the frost. It's, it's not very frost sensitive. So having these is really good for letting me finish off my season. Um, and it's, it's another section where I hoard things, but probably the one that no one really like talks about, um, the one that saves my butt, the one that goes with the sedum, it goes with the sunflowers, is this hedge here. And this is a nasty weed. This is Jerusalem's artichoke, which is impossible to kill once you put it into the ground. And so I put it into the ground knowing it was gonna be really isolated in this one spot. I do not water this. I do not weed this. I do nothing for this. I ignore it until this time of year when I need greenery. This goes past the frost. This has no issue. And these, they have a great vase life and they're big and full and bulky. So this, pairs really nicely to be my to be my fall bouquets this 
This has saved my butt multiple years in a row. So makes me reassured to have it sitting in the field. I also want to talk briefly about one more greenery. This is cinnamon basil. And the reason why I want to talk about this is my feelings on basil have changed over the years. So <laughs> when I started, pretty much the only greenery that I grew to go along with my bouquets was different basils. I had a lemon basil, I have the cinnamon basil. I even used just classic, you know, Ginovise basil. I had actually made an amazing filler too. And it was great because it bloomed um, and it was at its prime at the same time as all the summer flowers, like the like the zinnias and the cosmos. Um, but as I've, you know, branched off into growing for spring, summer, fall, um, I've been less focused on basil. There are things about it that make it a difficult crop to grow um, when you're looking for something that's just gonna work for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was great for me to, you know, for that small period of time and to grow a lot in a small space, but now it's not my number one go-to. But I still have an entire bed of cinnamon basil here, an entire 50 feet, and the reason is it's hard to beat the color on this cinnamon basil. It smells incredible, I love the smell of it, but also this dark, dramatic, color looks so good in fall bouquets. So this year, the only basil I planted was this specifically for fall. We started picking off of it now, and I will pick off of it very heavy until there's a risk of frost coming in our, in our weather report. And then I'm gonna pick the entire bed and whatever's left, I'll, I'll dry it because it actually makes a really good dried filler too. So basil, great for a beginner. Um, at the intermediate point, it still serves its purpose, um, but you know you need to think about why why you're growing something and what you're doing with it. Lots of people have issues with basil, um, with cutting it and it wilting. And the one thing that I found, because I've never had issues with that, is I don't grow basil for the leaves, right? It's only when it has these flowers that it's ready and to be picked. And you know, fair enough, this is where the purple is. If you get rid of that, it's, it's just a green plant. Um, once it has these like finished flowers, at any point, it's fine to pick. It's not gonna be all wilty, but if I tried to pick it before it bloomed, it'd be really hard to get it to last in the vase. I love all the flowers in the field. I love being outside, being surrounded by the blooms, but in the end, this is what having a flower farm is all about. It's about flowers being cut and prepared for customers to take home and to enjoy. They bring me so much joy. I like to think that they bring you guys so much joy to see them. And then in the end, they get to go home with people and bring them so much joy in their homes too. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's fun to know that we are there providing cut flowers for almost six months of the year. It's exciting to know that we're back into school. It is September, but the flowers, they're not gonna be ending anytime soon. We still got lots more flowers, lots more fun. So I hope you guys enjoyed seeing where the flower farm is at right now, um, but stay tuned because there is still lots of good stuff.